What I'm mostly going to be telling you about today is why quantum gravity is exciting and interesting in the first place. So I won't be going into almost any detail about some of those acronyms like ADS, but I perhaps should mention, given who introduced me, that uh, a lot of the work in the context of two plus one dimensional quantum gravity in anti sitter space uses churn simons theory. So uh, I should probably mention that. Um, anyway, so the talk is going to be about, what'd you say? Exactly. It was, it was, <laughs> someone was doing the right thing. <clears throat> so uh, I'll, I'll be telling you about why quantum gravity is an exciting thing to think about. And so a lot of the talk will actually be context of how we've established our understanding of the fundamental laws of nature up to this point. Um, and then I'll be explaining, uh, well, so I'll, I'll explain, for example, why we build these gigantic high energy colliders, why we're high energy physicists, why we spend so much money, et cetera, um, <clears throat> how that helps us learn about the laws of nature. And then I'll explain uh, why quantum gravity is, is different. So just reading the title of my talk, you might wonder, different from what? So, the answer to that question is different from our description of all of the other particles and forces uh, that we understand. Our understanding of, uh, of those things is encapsulated in what we call the standard model, which goes to show that uh, it's pretty well established. Um, and it appears to describe everything that we've tested. Um, if you throw in general relativity, our theory of gravity, it describes everything that, that we know in the universe. Now, if you've never thought about the standard model before, it probably looks pretty complicated. There are all these concentric rings. They contain particles. You might wonder, what are these rings? What do they mean? I could make it sound even more complicated by telling you things like that there are 19 different parameters parameterizing the standard model. Um, but actually, uh, I don't want to tell you it's complicated. Actually, it's all very, very simple. What really kind of matters in the standard model is there are these different forces mediated by different particles. So there's the electromagnetic force, um, there's the weak force, and the strong force. And strikingly, all of these forces, it turns out, are extraordinarily similar. So <clears throat> you may be familiar with the electromagnetic force. Um, here are some common manifestations of electromagnetism uh, as physicists like to discuss it. So you've probably seen lightning and cool uh, Tesla coil shows like that. That comes about because there's a notion of charge, opposite charges attract, uh, like charges repel. And as charge builds up somewhere, it wants to uh, uh, be expelled. And so charge jumps, and we get these, these cool light shows. Um, so this is a picture showing these sort of force lines between charges. Another feature of electromagnetism is that if you move charges around, they create magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields are very useful because they push on other magnets. And we can build useful technology like electric motors uh, in that way. And then a final uh, point about how electromagnetism works is that if you take one of these charges and you wiggle it a bit, then you make wiggles in the electromagnetic field. And that's how you create electromagnetic radiation, which we're most familiar with as light. Of course, electromagnetic radiation comes in all sorts of different wavelengths. It goes from radios to light to UV to x-rays to gamma rays, et cetera. But these are kind of the, the basic features of electromagnetism. And <clears throat> what I want to tell you is that the rest of the standard model isn't much more than that. So if I think of uh, electromagnetism and the light that's emitted when we shake electromagnetic charges via this picture, then uh, metaphorically, you might think of all of the other forces as kind of souped up versions of electromagnetism, which are basically the same. So I mentioned there are weak forces and strong forces in the standard model. The associated particles, just like particles of light are called photons, are W and Z bosons and gluons. But they're really not so very different from photons and from electro electromagnetism. In particular, you can think of W and Z bosons as basically being a lot like 
heavy versions of the photon. They're, they're photons that got fat, that have mass, but otherwise they're very, very, very similar. You can think of the strong force as being a lot like eight photons working together to make a, a much stronger force. And so really, uh, the lesson of the discovery of the standard model from uh, the work from the last 100 years has been a remarkable unification where, <clears throat> where all of the kind of fundamental forces are described in, in a very, very similar way. And I say that because you might also wonder, is gravity, and in particular quantum gravity, which means what, what we get when we combine quantum mechanics with gravity, just like all of the other forces, too. So there's a lot in common between gravity and the other forces. Um, <clears throat> in particular, we're used to thinking about the Earth going around the sun because gravity holds it in its orbit. Of course, that was an inspiration for thinking about the structure of atoms, <clears throat> that the electromagnetic force holds electrons in some sort of orbit around protons, and that's what creates uh, the structure of matter. And there's more similarity uh, than even that. I mentioned that the way that you get light and electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, et cetera, is by jiggling charged particles a little bit. And similarly, we discovered remarkably uh, confirmation of, uh, uh, of the theory of general relativity very recently with LIGO, which discovered, roughly speaking, that if you jiggle heavy things, they emit gravitational waves. Now, those heavy things have to be really big. Turned out they were uh, 15 solar mass black holes. They're not something that you can just sort of uh, jiggle uh, in your hand. But nevertheless, uh, they uh, emit gravitational waves. So a natural thing that you might think is that gravity is just another, uh, uh, another piece of the same story, that it will be described in a very, very similar way to these other forces of nature that are combined into the standard model. And of course, uh, the purpose of this talk is to contradict and undercut that idea. Um, and to make the point that in the last few decades, it's actually become increasingly clear that at least on a very fundamental level, gravity and the other forces of nature are very, very different. In fact, so different as to trigger a kind of revolution in how we think about uh, space and time and the fundamental description of the universe. And so what I mostly want to tell you about today is uh, why that's the case. So <clears throat> an outline of my talk is that <clears throat> in the first part, I'm going to talk about how we uh, very, very briefly, how we came to understand the standard model and the electromagnetic weak and strong forces. And we followed a path of reductionism. And what I mean by that word is just that we looked at stuff, literally the, the matter that we're all made of, on smaller and smaller distance scales and looked at what it was made of and interpreted the results. So that's, that's what I mean by reductionism. And uh, from that description, you might think that we just look at stuff at very, very small distances. So why do we have to spend all of this money building enormous particle accelerators? Why, in other words, are we called high energy physicists in the first place? And uh, I'll, I'll explain that in the first part of the talk. Then um, I'll ask a question, how do we know that there's more out there to discover? Both how did we know that in the past when planning prior experiments, when trying to figure out what the standard model was, and looking to the future, what hints do we have that there's something more, something new to discover? Um, and I'll point out that we can get such clues from basically certain kinds of very small interactions and tiny effects that somehow point out that maybe there's something new lurking if you just go to even shorter distances. If you ask not just what are atoms made of, not just what nuclei are made of, et cetera, but you follow that process further and further. Um, and then, of course, in the, the third part of the talk, I'll explain why, at a fundamental level, um, for quite simple reasons, none of this reasoning really applies when you think about combining quantum mechanics with gravity. 
And then instead, we need a, a very different holographic approach. And I'll give you very briefly, very briefly, a, a flavor of that approach. But uh, uh, if you want to know more, you'll have to ask me or, uh, or come to another talk. So uh, that's the plan. So I want to start by discussing how did we get here? How did we get to our present understanding of the laws of physics? So in this slide, we have a picture of uh, humanity's greatest accelerator. This is one of two experiments at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN on the Swiss-French border. This is the ATLAS experiment. There's another experiment that's uh, equally impressive, just isn't pictured. We have two experiments to make sure that we can double check all of our results. And what I want to explain is that this gigantic uh, experiment, which, is going to which has been detecting particle collisions and analyzing them, is in effect a, a gigantic microscope. So the question then is, why do we need these big accelerators? All we really want to do is sort of look at very, very, very small things under a microscope and take them apart. So uh, <clears throat> atoms have a characteristic size of 1 10 billionth of a meter. Atomic nuclei have, are, are 10,000 times smaller than that. Um, nucleons themselves are hundreds or thousands of times smaller still. And what we really want to do is sort of continue this process, learn what the building blocks of, uh, of the universe are. And so I'm just going to ask the most naive question, why don't we literally use a microscope to do that? So the reason why. Well, the reason why we've sort of used up the power of microscope technologies, at least as pictured on the last slide, is that to look at very, very short distances and follow this program, we actually need very large energies. So at the level of light and light waves, literally seeing with, uh, with, with visible light, um, light is a wave much like uh, a water wave. And if you've seen water waves, so in order to, in order to see something, you need light to reflect off of it in some way so that you can resolve its structure. For example, if you have a bunch of water waves and you have a gigantic aircraft carrier sitting in the middle of the ocean, then from the pattern of the waves hitting the aircraft carrier and reflecting off or, or blocking or being blocked by it, et cetera, you can see the shape of the aircraft carrier in those waves. But if you have, say, a single post from a pier and big waves crashing into it, they basically just go around and through the post. And there's no way to tell after the wave sort of comes out the other side that anything really happened, or at least any effect is very, very small. And the lesson of this is that you need a wavelength, sort of a characteristic size of a wave, that's the same size or smaller than an object you're trying to resolve to see it. So we, here we have listed the, the names and length scales associated with all sorts of different kinds of light, with the idea being that if you really wanted to see an atom or a nucleus, you would need very, very small wavelength, very high energy uh, x-rays or gamma rays. But still, this doesn't explain why we don't use a microscope. It says that we would use a microscope uh, with, uh, with gamma rays. So you can ask, is this really fundamental, or is it just because uh, we were using light? And why, do we use, why don't we just keep using light? Why don't we keep building something like a microscope? So the answer to the first question, is this really a fundamental feature of physics, is yes, it is a fundamental feature of physics. And it's due to quantum mechanics. So why are we high energy physicists? We're high energy physicists because of quantum mechanics. There is, in quantum mechanics, the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And I've, uh, I've, I've changed it a tiny bit from how it's usually presented. But roughly speaking, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that if you want to look at something that's really small at a very small distance, you need a big energy. Because the product of these two things, what you get when you multiply them, is bigger than or equal to uh, Planck's constant, the quantum mechanical constant h bar. In the classical limit, you ignore h bar and you say it's 0. And then you can probe, you can resolve arbitrarily short distances with whatever energy you want. But accounting for quantum mechanics, this is some fixed number. And so to get resolving power for very small objects, you need a ton of energy. 
So that's why ultimately we build big colliders, because we need a lot of energy to see really small things. And we don't use light. We don't use photons the way that you might if you were uh, a biologist studying a cell, because it's hard to give photons a huge amount of energy. Photons don't have charge, so you can't push on them. You can make a photon, but once you've made it, you're kind of stuck with whatever photon you made, whatever energy it is. Whereas with an electron or a proton, you can accelerate those particles by pushing on them with electromagnetic fields. <clears throat> That's why there are these circular colliders, because you can push and push and push and push and get to very, very high energies. So that's why we have the colliders that we have. So that's why we build colliders. Now I'm going to give you an incredibly abbreviated history of collider physics. So <clears throat> we've been doing collider physics for a, a very long time, uh, more than 100 years. So I've chosen to highlight this uh, initial very famous experiment by Rutherford and collaborators in 1911, which discovered the nucleus. So at the time that this experiment was conducted, no one knew whether there were nuclei or weren't. In fact, uh, people supposedly speculated that instead of the nuclei we now know exist, there might have been kind of a pudding, a kind of soft, gelatinous substance at the heart of the atom. Um, and so <clears throat> the motivation for Rutherford's experiment was, uh, was as simple as, 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 as can be. If you have jello and you throw a billiard ball at it at very, very high speed, or, or maybe better yet, you shoot a bullet through jello, then you expect the bullet's basically just going to go sailing through the jello and end up on the other side. But if lurking in, say, a thin film of gold foil, there's some heavy object like, say, another bullet, then you might expect that there's going to be a really, really hard collision and your initial bullet is going to go shooting out in all sorts of different random directions. And that's roughly speaking what, uh, what Rutherford, Geiger, and Marsden uh, did. They shot something like a bullet, an alpha particle, at uh, a thin film of gold, and were very surprised to find that uh, their initial alpha particle bullet went out in all sorts of different directions. And that's how we discovered nuclei. Now, there are many other important experiments over the next many decades that discovered the proton and the neutron, et cetera, which are the constituents of the nucleus. But I said this is a very brief uh, introduction to collider physics, so I'm going to jump ahead another 50 years. This is uh, where collider physics had gotten to in 50 years from the sort of simple cartoon I had on the last slide to gigantic particle accelerator detectors like this one. And uh, this is the experiment that found the first conclusive evidence of the substructure of protons and neutrons, namely quarks, through an experiment called deep inelastic scattering. So this was at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center uh, about 50 years ago. Now, how should you think about deep inelastic scattering well, scattering just means that things are colliding and scattering, and you sort of see what comes out. The words deep and inelastic are effectively summarized by this picture. So the words deep and inelastic mean that you're really uh, colliding things very hard. You have some hard uh, point-like particle, and you're smashing something. So what you're really doing is your hard point-like particle, which is sort of analogous to the baseball, is your electron. So electrons, as far as we know, are fundamental. They don't have any substructure, as far as, as far as we're aware, to the extent that we have investigated and been able to investigate. So they're very much, uh, they're very much like the baseball in the sense that uh, you're not going to break them. Um, and the, this sort of window is being analogized to a proton. So if you scatter an electron at very, very high energy off of a proton, then you can break it apart if, in fact, there is substructure to be broken apart. And the result of this experiment was that, in fact, there was such substructure. And Feynman and Burkain analyzed the results of this experiment. The results were very messy. As you can imagine, uh, this, is, this is a mess. It's hard to look at all of these different little pieces of glass flying away and figure out what exactly the window looked like before it was smashed. So there was some hard analysis to do. 
And uh, Feynman and Bjorken and others showed that the results of, of this experiment at, at Slack um, indicated that there were hard constituents lurking within the proton. So there were these quarks, which themselves looked like fundamental particles somehow joined together, and they were being ejected from, uh, from the proton. So that's another step in, uh, in our reductionist picture from atoms to nuclei, uh, nucleons, and then quarks. And skipping another 50 years, <clears throat> we have today, well, we have had a whole series of different high energy experiments. And we've put the pieces together, culminating in the Large Hadron Collider, which is this enormous collider uh, at CERN, in order to discover all of the pieces and ingredients in the standard model that I mentioned at the beginning, most recently and famously, uh, the Higgs boson. So all of this, all these collider experiments over the last 100 years um, have really told us a lot about how to sort of build a fundamental theory of the matter that, that we know, explaining the results of these experiments. Other experiments I haven't mentioned discovered the W and Z bosons, all sorts of other quarks and mesons and all kinds of other stuff. And that culminates in this picture of the standard model with all of these different kinds of particles. But if you're a cynic, um, you might wonder, do we really understand the world better from this? We have this complicated picture. We started out with Rutherford's understanding, not even knowing about atoms and nuclei. Um, and we have this complicated picture of the standard model. So you might wonder, what is it all good for? And I want to just sort of pause for a second to emphasize that it, it really is good for something. We really do understand the world we live in in, I think, a better way and a more complete and deeper way. So something that everyone has seen in school is the periodic table of the elements. Um, hopefully, you didn't have to memorize it or anything, but I feel sorry for you if you did. But anyway, um, this is uh, the periodic table of the elements. Now, if you're a theoretical physicist, you like to ask very, very, very basic questions. Um, if, for example, if you're a chemist, you might ask, what are the properties of oxygen or something? But if you're a physicist, you might ask much dumber questions like, uh, why are there roughly 100 elements? If you look at this periodic table, it goes up to about 118. And what gives? Why 118? Why isn't there just one element in the universe? Why aren't there a million different fundamental elements that are stable? Why? And this is something that I think we, we, we can address using the understanding that, uh, that, that we've gained. Um, the explanation I'm, I'm going to give you is extremely simple. It's just that in order to have an element, the nucleus of that element has to be stable. A nucleus, in order to be stable, has to have uh, attractive forces holding it together that beat any kind of forces that want to make it explode. And <clears throat> one thing that we've learned from, our, from, from the standard model and from uh, our quantum description of, of, of all these different forces is that forces like electromagnetism and also the weak and strong force actually have a kind of dimensionless way of saying how strong they are. There's a number you can attach to how strong the force is. And in electromagnetism, that number is approximately 1 over 137. <coughs> this number alpha is called the fine structure constant. It's very important in, in sort of determining all sorts of properties of, of, of matter and chemistry and all sorts of things like that. But it's basically the dimensionless strength of the electromagnetic force. Now, in the nucleus, there are neutrons, which are neutral. But there are also protons. There are some number of protons set by the, the element number, z. And all of those different protons want to push the nucleus apart and make it explode. But nuclei don't explode. And they don't explode because there's this other force in the standard model, the strong force. The strong force, uh, as it operates here, it's quite complicated. But breaking it down, it's a short-ranged force. It doesn't act over long distances. So for example, this nucleon and that nucleon can't pull on each other with the strong force. Um, but nearby nucleons can attract each other. So the strong force is very strong. It's short range. The fact that it's strong means that its sort of dimensionless strength is 1. That's as strong as forces get. Forces either have a strength of 1 or smaller than 1, like electromagnetism. And so 
Very roughly speaking, the reason why there are 100 elements in the periodic table uh, is because in order for stability uh, to be achieved, all of the different forces that add up in proportion to how many protons, how much charge there is in the nucleus, have to be balanced out by uh, the strong force. The strong force has to win over the repulsive force of electromagnetism. And so uh, writing an equation, we say that this number has to be positive, the force holding, uh, holding, holding the nucle nucleus together. And so the atomic number has to be smaller than something of order 137. Of course, if you want to get 118 or whatever, you need to do all sorts of much, much, much fancier analysis. But to get the order of magnitude correct, this is good enough as an explanation of why we have uh, roughly 100 elements in the periodic table. So hopefully that convinces you that this kind of reductionist approach actually gives you some insight into why the world is the way that it is. Um, now I want to ask the question, how did we and how do we know that there's actually more out there to discover? So the discovery of the nucleus was something of a surprise, but actually many of the other discoveries along the way, some of them I skipped for brevity, um, like the discovery of quarks, of the weak force, the Higgs boson, and many other things, were actually foreseen and predicted by theorists. And so it's natural to ask, how did we know there was something to look for? In some cases, like with the, uh, the weak force and the W and Z bosons, um, they were predicted well ahead of time in a certain sense. Um, well before there were any experiments that were just on the cusp of discovery. So how can you do that? Well, the question you want to ask if you're following this, uh, this reductionist program is, does really, really small stuff actually affect larger stuff? In other words, when you look at, say, the podium, can you tell that it's made of atoms? Of course, in the intuitive answer to this, I think, is no, you can't. You can't tell. And I've included these images to sort of illustrate that if something's made of really, really small pieces, like really, really small pixels, then you can't tell how big the pixels are or even that they're there. Now, if you're close to, uh, to the sort of resolving power or to, to the size of the pixels, then you can start to see that there's something there to discover. But intuitively, it seems like we're doomed. We can't really anticipate whether there's more to see or not. But there are two situations when uh, very small stuff does affect larger stuff. Um, one of them, so this might just look like a black slot, like a, a black image, but you might notice that there's some little faint blurry star in this picture. And the idea here is that if you have something that's, say, otherwise entirely black and there's a tiny little dim smudge, then maybe you can notice it and see that there's something there. Physicists would formalize this by saying that when some small effect breaks a symmetry, um, breaking a rule, for example, the rule here being this is just black and it's the same, it's uniform, it's black everywhere, then maybe you can have a chance at noticing it. Um, another situation where you can see very small effects is when they add up. So something you may or may not have ever wondered is why don't you fall into the center of the Earth? So the entirety of the Earth is pulling, pulling you down, but the electromagnetic force uh, between your shoes and the ground is sort of keeping you up. It's keeping you from falling through the Earth. Um, and what that actually says is not so much that it's a miracle that you don't fall through the Earth as that the force of gravity is very weak. So first I'm going to give you an illustration of how this kind of effect uh, occur can occur and can give us hints about physics. And then I'll talk about this other, which starts to get at, at, at gravity. So one example of this is the neutron lifetime. So neutrons, if they're free, live for about 15 minutes. Now, we as people tend to think of 15 minutes as almost the definition of a short span of time. But to a neutron, 15 minutes is actually quite a long time. So there's a sense in which there's a fundamental time scale to a neutron. You can think of it as having kind of like a clock inside of it or having some sort of quantum heartbeat if you're feeling poetic. And that fundamental time scale of the neutron is an incredibly tiny span of time, 10 to the minus 24 seconds, almost a, a billion, billion, billionth of a second. Um, so from the point of view of this fundamental time scale, the neutron heartbeat, uh, 
Neutrons that live for 15 minutes are actually living almost for an eternity. Um, they're living sort of a billion, billion times longer than us if you measure our lifespan in terms of our heartbeats. So we started out by saying neutrons live for 15 minutes. That might seem like a short time, but actually I want to ask why do neutrons live for so long? Or conversely, why do they live for so long but not forever? So why do they live so long? Well, naively from the description, the fundamental description of neutrons, only accounting for the fact that they're made of these quarks and the quarks are held together by the strong force, you might just think that neutrons would live forever. However, there are these interactions called the weak interactions. They're called the weak interactions because they're weak. Um, and they're associated with very, very high energy, very, very short distance physics. So this is a picture of a neutron turning into a proton and a very short-lived W boson, which then turns into an electron and a neutrino. And this is what's called beta decay. It's the decay of a neutron into uh, an electron, neutrino, and neutron, uh, and proton. And the theory of beta decay eventually led to, to W bosons. But beta decay was something that you could observe without having a really good microscope. Even though the interactions that are going on here are very, very high energy in some fundamental sense, and they happen very, very, very quickly, because the neutron would otherwise live forever, but instead it lives for 15 minutes, um, you can observe uh, this effect. And so uh, specifically, Fermi in 1933 suggested that there was some sort of energy scale or a distance scale of 10 to the minus 17 meters associated with some kind of new physics. And that was thousands, tens of thousands of times smaller than any experiment could probe when Fermi made up this 1933 uh, theory of beta decay. Um, so he was able to anticipate that there was something lurking around the corner. There was some new short distance scale associated with very, very weak effects that are observable only because if they weren't there, the neutron would live forever. Um, and here, I'm showing you a picture of sort of all sorts of different energy scales <coughs> that we have probed in high energy physics, corresponding to shorter and shorter distances going this way. So we've gone from uh, things like the discovery of nuclei to the Large Hadron Collider. And you could, in principle, continue this process further and further and further. And so a question you might ask is, do we have any hint that continuing this process of going to higher and higher energies right now is going to uh, bear fruit? So I mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago that you might wonder why you don't fall into the Earth. The reason why, uh, why you don't is that electromagnetism is so much stronger than gravity, or gravity is so much weaker than electromagnetism. It's fair to compare them in, in many cases because uh, the way that they act with, with respect to distance is the same. So the fact that, for example, electrons orbit protons and planets orbit the sun is because the forces behave with distance in the same way. And so it's fair to compare their strength. And we learn that gravity is very, very, very weak uh, at, uh, at the scales that we, we typically, typically probe. And so now I want to read this slide backwards. Instead of saying, why don't you fall into the Earth, I want to ask, how can you know that gravity exists at all? Gravity is incredibly weak. It's a billion, 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 billion or so times weaker than the electromagnetic force. So why do you see gravity at all? Why do we even know it's there? We know it's there because it adds up. That's the only reason. But the fact that it's very, 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 very weak suggests that it's actually associated fundamentally with very short distances or very high energies. One way of saying this is that uh, unlike electromagnetism, gravitational forces get bigger when energies get bigger. So in other words, the sun pulls on us a lot more than the Earth does if we're the same distance from the sun as we were from the Earth. If you have more and more mass or more and more energy, then gravitational forces get stronger and stronger and stronger. So you could ask, at what point do you have enough energy so that gravity is just as strong as electromagnetism? That motivates sort of asking about uh, very high energies or very short distances. 
And that leads to something called the Planck scale, which people like to think of as sort of the scale where quantum gravity is really obviously important. It's a scale at which space and time itself maybe fluctuate a lot. That's what this picture is showing. Um, but for our purposes, all that really matters is there's some very, 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 very short distance, much smaller than any distance that we've been able to probe with our accelerators, where gravitational effects become very big, very important, and maybe something new happens. So at this incredibly short distance scale corresponding to a very high energy scale, maybe something new happens. In the same way that uh, when we got to the size of a proton, we saw the proton was made of quarks, maybe if we can get to this fundamental distance scale or size associated with gravity, this Planck scale, then we can sort of see what really makes gravity tick. In other words, maybe if we had a microscope that could resolve it at this distance, we could take gravity apart like we took the proton apart and really see how it works. So that's the question then. What is quantum gravity? How should we study it? Can we, in fact, take gravity apart and learn what it is? In other words, can we approach gravity the same way we approached all these other forces? The weak forces were responsible to beta decay, and we built bigger and bigger and bigger colliders until we could study the, the, the size scale or the energy scale associated with that process and learn what really uh, underlies it and build a theory around it. Could we do the same thing? Should we do the same thing with quantum gravity? That's the question I want to ask. Um, but first, I should tell you, at least in a couple of slides, what I even mean by, by gravity and quantum gravity. So our theory of gravity, the best theory, the, the, the only theory we, we take seriously, is Einstein's theory of general relativity. Conversely, what is Einstein's theory of general relativity? It is a theory of classical gravity. Um, and famously, it's a theory of space-time curvature. So heavy objects like the Earth cause curvature in space and time that causes particles and light, both, to follow curved trajectories. And that's how the gravitational force effectively comes about. So what is quantum gravity? Quantum gravity is the, the attempt to unify general relativity with quantum mechanics. Now, this isn't something that we have no experience with. It's not something that we're going into blind. Quantum electromagnetism was actually the first ingredient of the standard model. It was understood in sort of in the 1930s through the 1950s. Pe people figured out how to start with classical descriptions of the electromagnetic force and unify them with quantum mechanics um, to get quantum electrodynamics. And that was sort of this first building block of, block of the standard model, which then was enhanced with the weak and strong forces. So in asking, is gravity very much the same as the other forces, we're, we're also asking, can we just sort of follow our nose, follow our prior footsteps, and learn about a theory of quantum gravity? Um, the answer is going to turn out to be uh, maybe not. Um, but to, to tell you why, I need to detour for just a second and, remind, and, and tell you about uh, one of the most interesting and generic objects in gravity, namely black holes. So in general relativity, if you start with a bunch of stuff, no matter what that stuff is, be it an encyclopedia uh, or a Honda Civic um, or the Earth, if you take all that stuff and you cram it down into a small enough space, you always get the same result, which is a black hole. And once you make that black hole, classically it will be inescapable. It will have what's called an event horizon. And the event horizon is this place where gravitational effects or gravitational curvature are so strong that if you cross the horizon, you can never come back. And these objects may sound fantastical, but of course, now we have a huge wealth of evidence for them. In particular, the, this is a, a sort of simulation slash artist's rendering of two black holes represented by these black uh, circles or disks <clears throat> that was observed by LIGO a couple of years ago now. Um, in spiraling together, making a ton of gravitational waves that we saw from, uh, from across the universe. So uh, this was a spectacular confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity, both of black holes and uh, gravitational waves. So we really know that these, these objects exist. And, and I should emphasize, they're really robust. If you want to make 
a, a computer, you can't just start with dirt and trivially make a computer. But if you want to make a black hole, you can start with whatever you want, and as long as you cram it down, down to small enough sizes, you'll make a black hole. So they're really kind of a, a very general thing uh, uh, that, that you can always make. And the first point I want to make about this question, can we investigate quantum gravity the same way that we investigated uh, quantum electrodynamics, <clears throat> is that black holes actually put an end to this reductionist picture. <clears throat> so remember, the whole point of building accelerators was to build really, really good microscopes to see very short distances. We needed, a micro we needed accelerators because to look at very short distances, we needed very big energies. But if you continue this process further and further and further, you'll need more and more and more energy. And you'll need to cram that energy into a tiny place so that you can have enough resolving power to see very short distances. But once you go to distances of order, this fundamental gravitational scale of the Planck uh, distance or the Planck energy, you'll start making black holes. You'll have successfully crammed all a ton of energy into a tiny, tiny place, and you'll make a black hole. And your black hole will then sort of destroy your microscope. So black holes really end this reductionist program. And I should emphasize that <clears throat> it's really not reductionism anymore. You might ask, but I can still do it. I can still, if someone will fund me, build an accelerator big enough to make these fundamental black holes and start investigating them. You could, you could try to do that. Um, but as you cram more and more energy into your accelerator, you'll just make bigger and bigger black holes. Black holes that swallow more energy are larger in size. So you won't be doing anything like reductionism anymore. Um, you won't be following the sort of rubric that we followed to, to discover the standard. So that's, that's the first point. So it seems like we really can't and shouldn't try to take general relativity apart. That's the lesson. Distances shorter than this fundamental gravitational scale can't ever be resolved in the same way that we resolved uh, atoms and, and nuclei. So it seems like uh, we're stuck. Well, we're stuck in two different ways. One of them is that I haven't emphasized it that much, but you'd really need an accelerator the size of the universe to sort of try to follow this, this prescription anyway. And uh, those are, uh, are, are, are too expensive even for physicists to ask for. Um, and furthermore, um, and furthermore, uh, you, uh, you, you, you wouldn't make a lot of progress that way anyway. But fortunately, the same object that sort of spelled doom for, uh, for this conventional fundamental physics program of looking to shorter and shorter distances, um, namely black holes, also point the, the way to uh, a very different approach to thinking about quantum gravity that, uh, that appears to be much more fruitful and doesn't require incredibly, incredibly expensive uh, colliders. So first, a detour. So <clears throat> I want to talk about something that might seem quite unrelated, which is how do you store information? So I store information on my hard drive. Um, what is a hard drive? Well, one way of thinking about a hard drive is that it's basically just some collection of little tiny magnets. And I can put each of those magnets either sort of with its north pole up or its north pole down. And I can store a bit of information, say a 0 or a 1, in whether that magnetic dipole is pointed up or down. So this is a sort of theorist's picture of, uh, of that, uh, that idea. I fill space with these little dipoles. And the red ones are pointing up, and the black ones are pointing down. And so that's how I encode bits. And that's really basically how hard drives work. I mean, uh, uh, there's sort of more area here than there is uh, depth. But anyway, I can stack these hard drives, and I can fill space with information um, in this way. And the, the lesson that I want to draw from this is just that information seems to be proportional to the volume that you have. Um, if I have twice as much, if I have a, twice as big of a box, I can put twice as many of these little magnetic dipoles into that box, and I can store twice as much information. Hopefully this is intuitive. This is also what fundamental physics without gravity would, would definitely tell you. Um, you might be able to store information 
more efficiently than with these dipoles. You might be able to use some other uh, fancier gadget built from the ingredients in the standard model, but ultimately the amount of information scales with the volume. So really our first explicit hint that there was going to be kind of a revolution in how we should think about the, the laws of physics um, came with Bekenstein and, and following up right, right away uh, Hawking in the early 70s, suggesting that actually the amount of information inside a black hole, like one of these black holes that LIGO detected, is not proportional to the volume of the black hole, but is actually proportional to the area, the surface area of the black hole. Maybe more specifically, the area of the event horizon enclosing the black hole. And it's the area measured in these fundamental Planck units. Since this is a very small length, that means that this number, if you wrote it out as a number, is a really, really big number. But nevertheless, this number scales with the area of the black hole, not with the volume. And so just to sort of restate that on another slide, because it's really important, um, this idea, uh, so what Bekenstein, what Bekenstein accomplished was to formulate something called black hole thermodynamics. But what thermodynamics really is, is it's kind of like a theory of information. So what, uh, what he showed was that event horizon area really determines how much information there is in a black hole. Here we have another black hole. I've drawn a little circle to denote its horizon. Really, its horizon would be a sphere enclosing the black hole. But because I flattened this uh, onto, uh, onto the screen, the, the area is just, just this, this circle. And this area is what denotes how much information I can store in a black hole um, fundamentally. So you might think to yourself, well, so what? Black holes are these weird objects. We're not trying to store information in black holes. But because I can make anything into a black hole, like I can start with my computer and then collapse it into a black hole, and because, uh, well, because of the second law of thermodynamics, information uh, and entropy can't be destroyed. It can only, it can only increase. Um, black holes really set some fundamental limit in how much information we have. Because information, uh, if it can't be destroyed, if information can't be destroyed, then if I start out with whatever information is in my computer, which I think of as being proportional to the volume of my hard drive, and I collapse it into a black hole, then that information better also be containable within the information in that black hole. And so this is really saying something very, very shocking, which is that once you have gravity in the universe, information capacity doesn't scale with volume anymore. It scales with area fundamentally. So this is sort of the most abstract slide. It sounds like I'm just talking about philosophy on this slide. So <clears throat> what I want to emphasize is that information really largely defines what we're doing in physics anyway. What is physics actually about if you try to formalize it? Physics is about saying what states nature can be in, what states the universe can be in, and then saying how they change with time. So in classical physics, this is pretty intuitive. I have uh, this bottle of water, and I describe the state of the bottle of water by saying where it is, what its orientation is, how fast it's moving, et cetera. That's, that's really what I'm trying to describe. And the point of the laws of physics is to say, well, where is it and how fast is it moving? And then where is it going to be and how fast is it going to be moving in the future? Now, in quantum mechanics, uh, the way that we describe states is a little bit more complicated, but really the goal of physics is, is to do this. And information is really just some description of, uh, of a state. Fundamentally, if I have all of the information that I could possibly ever have about a black hole, then I know what state it's in, I know what configuration it's in. Just like if I know exactly where all of the molecules in this bottle of water are, um, then I know exactly what that bottle of water is doing, and I can predict what it's going to do in the future using, uh, using laws of physics. So information about a black hole, just like information about the molecules in that bottle of water, is just a description of what a state is. So this may, be, may seem a little bit like a, a head scratcher, but if information is associated with surface areas, not with volumes, then actually volume and the space it contains, space itself, isn't fundamental. 
It isn't really what we should be fundamentally talking about when we talk about the laws of physics. So <clears throat> where does this lead us? So this leads to uh, uh, a new-ish, I say new-ish because it's something like 20 years old now, um, a new approach to how to think about quantum gravity. The idea, which is, and I mean, it is revolutionary, it should shou sound shocking and implausible, is that the fundamental theory of quantum gravity should have fewer dimensions. So why, why, where did, how did we get there? Well, I said that sort of the description of things should really live on areas. The amount of information in some region is proportional to the area bounding that region. And as a physicist, I'm very ambitious, so I'd like to describe not just some region, but the entire universe. If I want to describe the entire universe, then I need some area that's sort of out at infinity encompassing the whole universe. And that will be some, uh, and so I'll have some theory with one fewer dimension. I lost the dimension, which is the radius. I just have, I just have this area um, that describes everything. So the reason why, I, why we use the word holography for this idea is that objects like our hand dropping a, a apple falling towards the Earth in a gravitational universe are fundamentally being described by some lower dimensional theory that lives on an area, just like holograms look like three-dimensional images, but fundamentally they're two-dimensional uh, structures etched into, uh, into glass. So the idea is that uh, our approach to quantum gravity shouldn't take this reductionist route of taking things apart in space, because really space is an illusion, and instead there's this uh, holographic description. So if you've absorbed that, you should see that I'm telling you that quantum gravity is really very, very, very different from uh, the other forces. So is this all just words, or can we make it explicit? So in, in the last 20 years, we've actually learned how mathematically, in a great amount of detail, to not just, make, just, not just say this, this in words, but actually describe quantum gravity using some completely different description that doesn't have gravity and lives in fewer space-time dimensions. And the acronym for this is ADS-CFT. Um, what, uh, what does this acronym mean? Well, the ADS is the gravity thing. Why is it ADS? Well, it's gravity in sort of a weird universe that has uh, a constant negative curvature. That doesn't really matter very much. You can take a limit where ADS just becomes flat space. Flat space is what our universe looks like. Our universe looks flat because if you sort of go in this direction and turn right and turn right and turn right, 90 degree angles, you come back to where you started. So it's, it's flat like a, like a piece of paper. Um, our universe is approximately flat. It's not exactly flat. So try not to worry about this. This just means that we're describing quantum gravity. What is a conformal field theory? Well, it's... Uh, a theory actually a lot like our description of the strong force in the standard model, or the other forces, for that matter, um, which, however, is scale invariant. So uh, this is maybe a simpler example of scale invariance. Here we have uh, a fractal. A fractal is something which, when you zoom in, you sort of see the same thing that you saw uh, before. <clears throat> now. How does this correspondence work? How does a scale invariant theory correspond to a gravitational theory? Well, I can't tell you very much about it. And in fact, uh, 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 you'll, have to, you'll have to ask me afterward if you, if you want more details. But the most basic question you could possibly ask is, how can it be that one theory has two dimensions and the other theory has three dimensions? How could they possibly be the same thing? And you can think of the third dimension of the gravitational theory, the theory that, that's intuitive, as being kind of like going into this picture, zooming in further and further. If I have a fractal, if I have a theory that has the structure of a fractal, then I can zoom in more and more and more and I get the same thing. Now, one of the nice features of dimensions, one of the sort of fundamental features of a dimension of space is that I can move that way, I could just keep going and going and going, and the universe basically looks the same. So, the fact that the universe basically looks the same when I move in one direction in the gravitational description is related to the fact that when you zoom in on a fractal, it looks the same. 
This also has kind of an amusing connection with some of our discussion uh, in the first part of the talk. The first part of the talk, I was going on and on and on about reductionism, about zooming in and finding something different. So it's kind of amusing that the description of gravity is exactly some new theory where if you zoom in, you just find the same thing over and over and over again. Um, this picture, which is uh, harder to interpret, is an M.C. Escher drawing. He did something a lot fancier uh, that's harder to see. But he drew a picture gallery where there was a picture in the picture gallery that had the original image of the picture gallery. And so you can sort of keep zooming in and in and in and find more and more copies of the same image uh, with, a, with a cool distortion. Um, and there's a longer story about this involving, uh, involving conformal, the word conformal that appears in this CFT. Um, but uh, uh, I'm uh, <coughs> not going to tell you about it unless you ask. So uh, to conclude, I've outlined how this basic reductionist approach has been extremely successful in building the standard model. Over the last 100 years, we've learned a lot about the fundamental description of the universe uh, by, by taking this, this basic approach. But it appears that because of black hole physics, gravity is really very, very, very different from the other forces. Even though at face value, there are orbits in gravity, just like you can have orbits through the electromagnetic force. There are gravity waves, just like there are electromagnetic waves. Actually, at a fundamental level, gravity is very, very different. And theorists like myself are currently uh, trying to build a better and better understanding of this idea of holography to provide a really complete theory of quantum gravity and to answer all sorts of deep questions uh, that, uh, that, that still haven't been answered about black hole physics um, and uh, the emergence of space and time. So uh, that's it. <clears throat>